writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of mystery, science fiction, horror, poetry, and currently working on a new novel called Pattern of Lies. We'll find out if it gets published or not. <laughs> and with me today is... Your co-host, Kathleen Kayembe, author of Urban Fantasy and Lover of Things. Uh, Meredith Tate, author of Speculative YA and New Adult. Uh, Matt McGraw, I write uh, short stories. I'm working on a book called Patrick the Spider with Jennifer. Uh, I also did some narration for a uh, story called The Mentor yeah. that T.W. Fenley wrote. You'll hear Aaron, two people. <laughs> uh, Brad R. Cook, I wrote The Iron Horseman, which is a steampunk novel, which if you go to my website, bradrcook.com, you can see all of Jennifer's amazing artwork. <laughs> um, so, check that out. I also uh, president of St. Louis Writers Guild and uh, publishing at Blank Slate Press. I'm T.W. Finley. I wrote The Labyrinth of Time, which is a young adult fantasy. And it also features Jennifer's artwork on the cover. Ooh. And uh, as Matt said, I do have an audiobook coming out pretty soon, both of The Labyrinth of Time and the short story that Matt did. So I'm really excited about that. They should be coming out probably within the next month. Excellent. Yay. Vidora Amos, I'm president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime, and I write Victorian Who Done It, like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. I'm Melanie Planey. I write uh, sci-fi, fantasy, and nonfiction. I'm Jennifer Solzer. I'm a uh, children's author and illustrator. I write fantasy, and uh, I'm available. Check me out. <laughs> uh, JenniferSolzer.com uh, commissions, children's books, comics, whatever. I'm very popular. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of my two favorite illustrators, and I don't know who's topping who. Oh. So... Mm. So now it's a fight to the death. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I like I'll get draw, you two together. Draw. Yeah. It's a draw. <laughs> it's a draw to the death. Okay. It's a draw. In our introduction. Yeah. In our introduction today, actually, is the topic is... Oh, writing about differently abled characters. And as an MSW, I will be getting on my mental health soapbox and talking about that. And <laughs> so MSW, you have been would you please define that? Mm -hmm. uh, Master of Social Work. I'm also a licensed certified social worker. Um, and I've worked as a therapist for families, individuals, and couples. What's so she's name? an expert. Yes. Meredith. Gee, I would not say I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. She, you don't say it. We say it. I just, I just like to vent a lot about misconceptions and fiction about and mental health. I will say, as someone that's had personal, a lot, of, a lot of personal experience with people with mental illness, and I'm talking about actually diagnosed mental illness by psychiatrists, and someone that's also had a good deal of personal experience with people with physical disabilities, and people with learning disabilities, I personally don't like the term differently abled. <laughs> <laughs> what, what term I, do you prefer? Well, I maybe it's just the era I was brought up in, but I was never offended by disabled. And for instance, I have dyslexia. I kind of buy differently able for that because I'm better than average at some things, although I'm worse at average in other things. So, okay, that's different. But, you know, my mom is... Almost, well, my mom is very hard of hearing to the point of being deaf without her hearing aids, almost. And she doesn't have additional abilities that other people don't have because they can hear. She has a, less, a lesser ability to hear. You know? So, uh, can you guys give us a rundown of what we're discussing today? We're going to talk about characters that are in stories, be it in books, television, movies, you name it. That I don't want to use the word handicap because that is such a bad connotation to it. But characters who have got some kind of Meredith the, is disability still. A I, I'm going to have to use disability. A person with disabilities usually, Please, yeah, you would always say person-centered, person with something. Never in the social work world, you would never say a schizophrenic. It's a person with schizophrenia, and um, I know in school they always had us call people um, differently abled, uh, but I know that that could change 
state by state or area by area or in that's Europe just what I know and that's what I how I refer in era by era but I'm going to talk about like characters that are blind in our detectives or who characters who are hearing impaired <laughs> going but, off of that uh-huh. I also <laughs> my other peeve <laughs> Meredith is about to explode yeah. just a moment ago she's gesticulating wildly <laughs> So I also, I worked for the Association for the Blind for a year, and one of the biggest pet peeves of the agency, which is predominantly run by people who are visually impaired, is the term blind. The reason why is because when people think of blind, they think of somebody who opens their eyes and sees black, nothing. Whereas most people do see something. They can see colors, they can see shapes, outlines, so they prefer the term visually impaired. So that's, I will... Then I stand corrected. Hearing impaired. <laughs> okay. If I talk about the, I don't use the word deaf because I grew up around mm. people who are hearing impaired. Um, it can be other dis- other situations that they have. It could be mental conditions. It could be economic conditions and so forth. Can it be These fictional are conditions. Educational. Di- hey, fictional I'm, lear- I'm learning. Fictional conditions. <laughs> fictional conditions. I'm learning disabled in real life. I was told throughout school I was stupid. I have an IQ or higher than teachers. <laughs> Enough said. So I'm going to turn this over to one of these two who got their hands up. But Brad, I think you were first. So I'll just I'm just going to throw out, I mean, you've been throwing out all these things, but we haven't actually given it an example yet. And one of my favorite examples actually is recent. Um, it's from How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> um, the character of Hiccup. Uh, he does not start off. The dragon actually starts off with a handicap. But by the end of the first movie, uh, our main character has a handicap. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we're going to be very non-PC today, but that's okay. Uh, but the whole point is, is that it's, and I think the great way of touching on it, and one of the things I love about the movie, is it's not the focus of the movie. Mm-hmm. It's a part of the movie, but it's not the focus of the movie. It's happening. Just as it is with everyone else in real life who has to struggle with anything, mm-hmm. you know, it's a part of your life. It's incorporated into your life, and I think as a storytellers, we need to do that. But that's one of the reasons I love that movie, is because though it's a feature of the story, it's not the center point of the story. Definitely. Although I do think they used it beautifully because Hiccup and Toothless, the dragon, mm-hmm. both of their impairment, impairments are the same. Yes. So it connects the two yes. of them. Yeah, they and do it beautifully. It's one of the most beautiful stories told in terms of telling a, a story that is not necessarily like your standard run-of-the-mill kind of a story. It's beautiful. Um, I was going to bring up uh, when you guys were talking about Uh, hearing impaired and visually impaired, um, the spectrum of ability Mm -hmm. in many different forms. Like, there is a a quote-unquote normal that is the center of that spectrum, but you can veer to either side, Mm -hmm. and that's when things, terms like disabled or impaired or handicapped come up. And it's not necessarily that those are bad places to be on the spectrum. It's just that for most people, they're in the middle. And so if you're a standard deviation or so out, it makes things more difficult for you. Oh, and by the way, they're actually, for a lot of things, like hearing and seeing, they're not in the middle. They're normal is actually towards one end. (laughs) So there you have it. If you're in that range of quote-unquote normal, great. But it doesn't make being outside of it bad. It just makes it different. Mm -hmm. So I like this term differently abled. I had not really heard much of it. Mm. So from the point of view of a writer, going as far as you can possibly go can do a lot for your career. That may sound mercenary, but that's where I'm coming from right now. Jeffrey Deaver, I think, built his career upon one story. It is The Bone Collector, Mm -hmm. and it features a man, a former forensic expert named Lincoln something or other, that is completely and totally disabled, if you will. He is a quadriplegic and can move just a very little portion of his body, and he is also suicidal. Mm -hmm. He was ready to die. However... Through the course of the novel, he is reclaimed and wants to live. And not only that, he fights the killer to a standstill. Now, it's true he does have to be rescued in the long term, but he uses everything at his 
that he possibly can use. He uses his bed. He uses his mouth. He, he really tackles the killer and almost kills him. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is an inspirational story, and it is the foundation of Deaver's career. I it love that story. It has also been made into a film starring Denzel, Denzel Washington, Washington and Angelina Jolie. Yes, and, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and it was tense. Mm -hmm. Very much so. So, what did Deaver do when writing a character who was quadriplegic that made him so compelling as a character, in your opinion? And how do we do that? Well, because he kept finding things that this person who seemed to be utterly unable to do anything and unwilling to do anything because he was ready for suicide, that he found a reason to live and he found a way to fight, and I find that most creative. As someone who hasn't read the book, how... Well, I'm trying to come up with the right word. The closest I can come up with is how plausible were the things. For, for instance, it was someone that was quadriplegic, technically, without magic, quote-unquote, being put in, able to do the things he did in the novel. Well, he had a little bit of function. I okay. mean, he wasn't a quadriplegic, like, total. It was through injury, I believe. Yes. Well, most um, quadriplegics are yeah. through injury. So but... he's uh, he had the ability to, like, he could control his bed using thumb commands. And um, he could control a little bit of the way his trunk would move. So that's, that's what they used. Mm -hmm. But most of his, yeah, most of his uh, successes, he stayed at home, obviously, in his controlled environment. Mm -hmm. But he was using his experience as a detective yeah. to then guide the uh, his, his young assistant in the field as she went around. Uh, kind of reminds me of per, uh, Hercules Perot or what, how Hercules. 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 Thank Hercules. Thank you, I cannot pronounce that. But <laughs> no Hercules can. is close. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to change characters. Uh, one of my favorites, and Brad, I think you've seen it as well, it Lasted in film and television for 25 yeah, plus years. And there you go. Yeah, in Japan, yeah. and you can get the movies. <laughs> oh, that one. You can get the movies over here, and they are on Netflix. Zaidoichi, the Blind Swordsman. Yes. And that's the name of it. Not. There's also an Americanized version called Blind Fury with Rucker Howard. Yeah. I haven't seen mm. these films. What are they? Well, the Blind. I haven't seen Blind Fury. Blind it's pretty straightforward. Oh, the Swordsman is blind. Yeah. yeah. But he's awesome. Zaidoichi. What does he do? Well, okay. Zaidoichi is a gambler. He is a masseuse, um, which he can cause a lot more damage than <laughs> he did cure. He traveled around. I always got the impression it was Tokugawa um, time period Japan. I can't always confirm that, but that's watching it. That's always been my impression. And he is. I forget why he's roaming, but he's basically a roaming. Um, person going from town to town throughout Japan he ends up getting in fights with um, usually bent samurai or um, yakuza, which is the organized crime. He was kind of the Lone Ranger. He yeah. was Ronan. Yeah, he was yeah, little, kinda. kind of sort. Yes, and he his, his cane that he walked with was a sword cane. And there's the coolest, another yeah. reason why I love him. Is while his he was always under under arm or reverse katana, his style of draw and all that is also kind I studied. So it's like yes, I get to see this in real life. Besides just training wise, um, I say real life because unfortunately on one of the movies I know at least he brought a real sword and ended up killing an actor by accident. Oh, um, that's a much later not later later movie, but yeah, it was a different era. Different era, but yeah, the era where they had live steel accidentally exactly. killed each yeah. other on set. Oh, but he, realistic. Basically, <laughs> basically, in a lot of ways, you can call him the Jack Reacher of his time. To borrow something Melanie always says, is, oh, this guy ends up in trouble by coincidence." Well, kind of, sort of, yeah. Zaidoichi did. Um, it's okay to become in trouble by coincidence. Yes. It's bad to get out of trouble by coincidence. I know he was looking for his love at one time, and he found it depends her. upon the movie. Yeah. So uh, in, in different movies, he's doing different things. He has different reasons for running across the. Yeah. How do they handle his visually impaired self? Well, as a character. The that actually being blind and being a masseuse in that era and that culture at that time was not uncommon. For whatever reason, 
blind, a lot of blind people became masseuses and were trusted even when other people would not be allowed in the area. Um, be it, let's say Brad is part of the ruling class and he's talking to me, I'm part of the ruling class. The masseuse could come in, we could be talking about state secrets, we wouldn't care. Now, why blind versus deaf? I don't, or hearing impaired, I don't know. But they anyway, never that, swear to who they saw in the room. Right, that was part of it. Um, so he, well, the, sure. the, the actor kept his eyes, looked like he was kept his eyes closed most of the time. Um, you would often see kids in the movies making fun of him. And like in medieval times in Europe, lepers, they had to have bells when they walked. So did, he has a bell he has to ring, that's always ringing when he walks, depending on the movie, but usually that's the case. With blindness, mm -hmm. or <laughs> not being able to see as well as some other people, <laughs> <laughs> to be a little more politically correct, Visual I suppose. Visual impairment. Yeah. Visual <laughs> impairment. Thank you. Thank you. Please forgive us all for the slip-ups we're going to have. In the case of Zadoichi, that, that was the title of it, so go ahead. <laughs> well, at any rate, there is a general belief, and I think it's often used by writers mm -hmm. that when one loses a particular scent that others come to the forefront and make up to some degree for that. Take for example a film with Owen, uh, Clive Owen, which is called Second Sight mm -hmm. and he is losing his sight and trying to hide that from the people that rely upon him and finds that he is able to get visions and it makes for a wonderful transition perhaps from and reliance upon one sense primarily to reliance upon others. Mm -hmm. um, just because we're talking about visual impairment, something else is that um, I think something I notice a lot in movies and books with visually impaired characters is that a lot of them have guide dogs, um, which is interesting. There are obviously a lot of people who use guide dogs, but it's actually not super common. <laughs> they're um, expensive. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. very expensive. Um, there are actually a lot of requirements to getting one, um, including a lot of times going away to a, um, some sort of camp training. Um, to get one, and actually most visually impaired people use a white cane mm -hmm. instead of a dog, but I see guide dogs in books and movies all the time, but not as often in real life. Is um, there a reason it's white cane all the time? Yes. I do know this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason why it's a white cane is that there's supposed to be a white cane with a red tip. It's so yep. that there would be an international symbol for blindness. You can go in any country with your white cane and a red tip, and people will know that you're visually impaired. Going back to Zaidoichi briefly, mm -hmm. uh, one thing with... Um, I've learned, I've heard that really that the idea that your other senses becomes hypersensitive really is a myth, but you rely on them more. Um, in the case of Zaidoichi... Daredevil would argue with you. I know. <laughs> I was going to bring him up. I, I was going to argue with you too. <laughs> yeah, but um, Zaidoichi learned was a blind fighter. And I don't mean that as in having the handicap or having the disability of being blind there's a style of fighting called blind fighting. And he automatically learns how to fight. And you learn how to cue off of the things you're hearing. And that's what he would use. It was a commercial. God, I can't remember what they advertised, but I, I fell in love with it. It was, once again, a visually impaired um, person in this commercial. She was blind. She, it was a she. And she's learning martial arts. And she's kicking the two instructors. And she's doing a mass attack fight and walk out. You don't know she's that she's visually impaired until she walks out with the cane. I wish I could remember what was advertising. Well, kind of to this point, I, when I was young, I did lose my hearing mm -hmm. for a while, and I didn't really realize I'd lost my hearing because I compensated for it by reading lips. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we found out is my mother kept getting on to me because I wasn't paying attention to her, and then we found out you know, that that mm -hmm. was going on. So I think you do compensate, and it may yes. not be a superpower, no. but nonetheless, I think you, you do find ways around. And as a writer, you know, I think that's important uh, you know, to pay attention to things like that because they're very important. I did want to bring up you know, we, uh, one of the things as a child. You know, we had a lot of great stories uh, when I was younger that one of my favorite ones was The Secret Garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was one my teacher read in class to us, and it was about a, a boy who's in a wheelchair and this really obnoxious girl who comes. And together, you know, they kind of cure each other. And I think it provides a mechanism for people to talk about things that are broader than abilities or disabilities, but how you move forward uh, as people. And, you know, so he was able to help her become more socially acceptable, mm -hmm. and she was able to help him heal, you know, and get better. 
So I think there's a lot of stories like that where it's um, uh, just a, a way to get that point across, maybe. Jen, you had your hand open. Um, I don't know. Are we ready to switch topics? Because I was going to switch to a different aspect of this. Oh, go for it. Well, I'll jump in real quick then. Uh, then we'll back to you. Right. I'm just thinking, like, uh, in the coldest possible sense with uh, dis characters with disabilities, uh, the blindness here is something we're using to, like, make mess with audience expectations and also uh, provide, like, something new and interesting about, like, an action movie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like a Zatoichi, you know, like the audience comes in, oh, he's blind, oh, won't that mean he's terrible at fighting? But then he, like, he fights a different way, and like, oh, this is kind of exciting and new and fresh. Mm -hmm. And uh, to go in the coldest sense as a writer, that's something you can use. Yeah. Uh, if you have, like, you know, a detective who doesn't have the use of his arms and legs and all that. Uh, it adds an extra level of complication and forces you to be a little more creative. How is he going to do things, you know, that a detective should do? Yeah. Uh, and it's all, it just helps you complicate, create new things. And it's a good, like, it's a good tool to have, I suppose. Okay. Diane, Diana? Yeah, um, okay. I will say from the writing point of view, from the, uh, I, hopefully this won't get into what you want to talk about, but um, there is a big difference between having had this level, whatever level of build your hair character has, being fully adapted to it, versus this is a recent thing, mm -hmm. versus this is a temporary, or this is the rest of my life. Me, personally, I went through a period of about five weeks, during part of which, maybe not the whole five weeks, but a good two, three weeks of it, I could see stuff, but I would have met the legal qualification for blindness <laughs> during part of that. I mean, I could not see well enough to read, I could see well enough to get around, certainly not well enough to drive, luckily I could walk to work. I couldn't see well enough to, uh, I only stayed at home for two or three days, other than that I could read when I got things real up, you know, blowing up real big. But, you know, I compensated a whole lot differently than if I had known this was going to be the rest of my life, versus this has been my life until this point. Right. Mm -hmm. you know. um, I wanted to take a moment to address when writing people with different abilities and different limitations goes poorly. <laughs> yes, yeah. please. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy for people to forget that there's a human being as well as a condition yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when your character is... Uh, you introduce a blind character and suddenly that character is the blind character <laughs> and they don't have any opinion outside the fact of reminding people that they're blind. <laughs> um... I don't, I have, it's not really an example of that specifically, but I was thinking, uh, talking about detectives and things like that, um, in CSI, the original CSI, uh, the lead, they decided that a, a plot element later in the seasons, uh, that their lead mm -hmm. investigator was going to start losing his hearing. Uh, he already knew how to sign because his mother, uh, was hearing impaired, but he was going to start losing his hearing, and they used that through, I think, multiple seasons as he slowly, like, mm -hmm. had to cope with the fact that his abilities had changed. And after they went through all this, they had him have a surgery and he was magically better because that plot element was open. Yeah. And that upset me, and I thought of that while we were speaking, so I wanted to open that up. I don't know mm -hmm. if that inspires anyone else mm -hmm. to jump into this topic. Apparently. Um, I have a couple of things. First of all, I, I do, I find it um, almost offensive where kind of the point is to cure the person of their yeah. disability or of their mm -hmm. um, mental illness rather than just accepting kind of for who they are and then everybody has different limitations and abilities. Um, and another another thing going off of that, going off of when, what Jen brought up of things done poorly when they're done poorly that really irritates me again as a mental health worker <laughs> is if you are writing a contemporary book about a mental health center or psychiatric ward and it looks like something out of One Flew Out of the Cuckoo's Nest <laughs> then you're doing it wrong <laughs> and the reason why this bothers me is because if you're showing a mental health center as some place that looks like a prison where people are drugged up zombies and they are violent the message that sends that people with mental illness need to be locked up and need to be drugged. And if um, I had to go into a lot of psychiatric wards for work, and I'll tell you, a lot of them look like college dorms. They do not look like prisons. Um, so it's just one of my peeves in writing. Yeah, I, I, will, I will say I've never been a patient there, but I have visited the locked wards, and you're right. <laughs> <laughs> 
their limitations are kind of funny though because of for safety concerns. I mean, yeah, like you know, a lot no of pencils them, in the room. Yeah, <laughs> but like the doors are locked, but at the same time, it's like nobody's a prisoner. Nobody is being forced against their will to take meds. Nobody's being drugged up so that they're like a vegetable and can't speak like that. I see that that in movies all the time, and it makes me want to rip my hair out. Now, if you want to go to some nursing homes, oh. <laughs> that's a different story. Yeah, that's where those people's gone to. No, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm hearing from Jen the the magical cure that mm-hmm. is upsetting to people in general because it cheapens characters. Hearing about that, and I'm hearing about writing characters who have impairments that the writer may not have, and thus may not have an accurate idea of to be able to per- portray it properly, as you said with the, uh, the wards. So how do you do that research? How do you make sure that if you're writing a character with an impairment of any kind, that you are accurate and you are treating the character with the dignity they deserve as a person? Let me jump in on a couple of things. Because um, you, you've opened up a good can of worms. Number one, let's talk about the magical cure first. In the world of the hearing impaired, the they have a very extremely tightly knit community. Um, if you have, if you want to write about them, if you want to learn about them, you try to get to somebody who is hearing impaired who actually will trust you to introduce you into the community. It is they don't trust hearing people. Well, to be perfectly honest, that's yeah, true. Yeah, it's, yeah. Called, it's called deaf culture. It's a very real it's, thing. Yeah, yeah, it's very much so, yeah. And the, in the deaf culture, just like a lot of other, I'm sorry to use this word, but I'm going to say it, minority cultures, there are phrases. And in, of course, certain things. People who get the colloquial, cochlear implants, which is now technically the Magic cure in real life Quote for yeah, and I put that in quotes. Um, magical cure for hearing impairedness. They've just knocked they, they a lot of the parents who put their kids through this don't know they've just knocked their kids out of the hearing impaired community. Yeah, they put them into the hard of hearing community. Yeah, yeah. And, and, which is and it is different. That's where my mom is. <laughs> and they have a term, and I am now because of course this is not visual. Uh, anybody who is um, around me right now will see I'm making the sign. He is. Uh... I've got two fingers by my ear, circling, and that is a term in of sign language called a hearing. Mm-hmm. In the black or African American community, there's a term called an Oreo, which is somebody who is black on the outside but white on the inside. A hearing, which all these cochlear implant people fall into, is somebody who is. Hearing impaired on the outside, but a hearing person on the inside, and it just it it, it becomes an anti culture situation. Go ahead. I learned the sign for vampire and for cochlear implant, and it's the vampire is on the neck, the two mm-hmm. fingers. Cochlear implant is the same two fingers right behind the ear. Exactly, mm-hmm. and that's the interesting thing. Um, but if you're going to deal with, I'm going to just make a suggestion. Where this is where I was going with it. If you're going to have a magical cure in your story, show the downside mm-hmm. of that magical cure. Um, that makes major character conflict if you really want to do it. I have uh, magical cure stories. Um, something that I love about Lesson 3 Press is their uh, fairy tale retellings. And they had a Beauty and the Beast retelling where the beauty character has um, a malformed arm and he walks with a limp. And when he meets the beast, he gets along great with the beast because finally there is somebody that he knows who is not looking like everybody else. Someone who looks to him the way everybody else looks at him. And so they get along fabulously. And when the beast transforms back into this gorgeous human being, the beauty character is taken aback because suddenly the beast is unreachable. And he's not healed magically in the story. That would cheapen their entire relationship dynamic. And I went to a reader con panel about characters with disabilities and the overwhelming response to the whole magical cure thing is, why is it broken? It's not broken. Why are you fixing this? This is just offensive. Mm-hmm. 
I was just going to say uh, that, you know, in terms of dealing with any time that you're going to have a disability handicap or whatever you want to play off, if it's mental, if it's physical, whatever, uh, and we talked about this last week with uh, the, well, I don't know if it's going to be last week, but on a recent episode uh, with drug addiction, you know, you have to seek this out. You have to tell this story from a very truthful part, not only because the people out there are going to be judging you based off what you write, but you also have people who you're now introducing them to this world. Uh, they don't have anyone around them who has, you know, who's different than them. So now you're introducing them. So it's important to remain true to all of that. And to be honest, how do you do that? You reach out to the community. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're writing a book that, you know, about any subject, you should reach out to the people who are in that, you know, who are already living that. Some, some of these communities you can volunteer for, and I've got two And people. that includes things like, that's good yeah. for any kind of writing. You want to yeah. write a mystery, you should probably look into the cops. Uh-huh. You know, how, mm-hmm. do the, how do police procedurals go? Uh-huh. Uh, let's see, you mentioned earlier about uh, how do you treat these characters with dignity. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't believe in treating characters with dignity. Just in <laughs> uh, and so... Matt characters don't like them. Uh... So I kind of go with uh, doing the research and the realism. I mean, you're probably going to find aspects of anybody's life that aren't particularly dignified. Yes. Mm -hmm. Humans are like, you know, dirty, uh, half-animal creatures. (laughs) All of us are. Uh, So you have to, you can't like be too off-handed, like too hands-off with people or with characters with disabilities. Because you also have to show that real half of them that there is, like, some parts of it that are bad, obviously. Like, uh, you know, if you're blind, there are some things you can't do. There are some things you can't be part of. But, you know, there's other aspects of it that are also good. Uh, You could be a blind, awesome swordsman, maybe. Uh, So you have to to get both angles, and you can't be uh, too respectful, I guess. Don't be, like, too kitty glove with them, either. I should rephrase then. Um, When I said dignity, I meant as a character, as a person. You're going to want a whole character. Yes. Please don't make message characters. I hate them. Mm -hmm. I hate them so much. (laughs) Don't forget, I'm the one who can't see. Cater to me because I'm the one who can't see, and that's my only character element. I don't have opinions about anything that's going on in my life. Or any of my friends, I don't have relationships with people, I'm just the blind character, and that is my point in the story. To simply translate, (laughs) your characters who have any kind of other ability, shall we say, or a different ability, is as human as any other character you're writing, do not make them paper thin, bring them to life. That's what I meant by dignity. Mm -hmm. Um, Just talking about magical cure... We talked about the cochlear implant being the magical cure for deafness. Well, there's the equivalent that's not open to all people with visual impairments, but there are a few causes of visual impairment that a surgery could magically cure it. Um, And it's interesting because pretty much a large number of people that have had this magical cure, first off, they don't get back, their eyes are working normally, but it's like they ha- their brains haven't processed things, so it's like they can see color, they can see movement. Maybe they can be trained to recognize that blob as a person, but good luck recognizing faces. But a uh, point is, over half of them develop major depression. Uh, there's this man, he was skiing while he was pretty much completely unable to see. He still goes skiing. He closes his eyes. He cannot ski with his eyes open. <laughs> Um, this has made me think of it's a recent, recently adapted into a film, but mm-hmm. a best-selling book, uh, *The Fault in Our Stars* by John Green, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. is about uh, young people with cancer, mm-hmm. and that was written. John Green worked as a chaplain with cancer patients, so he was well informed on how uh, mm-hmm. how that works, even though he himself didn't have cancer. Um, but a point that the characters in the book made was that all of the kids who were cancer patients, they hated cancer books. And the idea of the cancer kids that everyone just feels sorry for. Mm -hmm. And the main character, her favorite book in the whole world is called, what was it called? Uh, It's an Imperial Affliction? Yeah, an Imperial (laughs) Affliction. And it's this hyper-literary 
downer book from the point of view of a girl with cancer, and in the end, the girl just dies. Mm. And she loved that book because it felt like the only real telling of a cancer story to her in the book, which is interesting because it kind of gives you a window into what it's like to be someone, in this case, someone with cancer, and how that, you know, all these soft kitty glove characters, as Matt said, those don't feel real Right. To, yeah. to her, because Hazel's looking at them like, this is a kind of, they're kind of cheapening the real serious emotional adventure that she's on right now. Okay, <laughs> to jump off that, uh, <clears throat> my biggest pet peeve in any movie or story are asthmatics. <laughs> I, I am asthmatic. I do not suck on my inhaler every five seconds. The only way I can take a breath is not by going, Shh, oh, now I can breathe again. You know, that is the worst. Goonies, I'm sorry, is the worst movie for asthmatics ever, and they still do it to this day. I was watching some movie not too long ago where the character was asthmatic and he was running around hitting his inhaler every 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. What about Hitch? What? The movie Hitch. Yeah. Where the guy was asthmatic and he's like, Okay, enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get the girl. It's like really. Yeah, really. Like an asthmatic can't get the girl. I mean, I know I sound like Darth Vader when I talk and breathe, but come on. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, and it's, it goes to that. Like I have never read an asthmatic story where they talk about the constricting of the lungs, where they talk about that inability to breathe, where they talk about you know being totally cognitive of everything around you without the ability to actually breathe and knowing that death is not that far off. Mm-hmm. You know, like. Those kinds of things have never been touched on in any asthma. It's just suck on that inhaler. And I hate it. Because it's always told from someone whose only experience as an asthmatic is watching someone with asthma use an inhaler. Yeah, do you know how high that person would be? Like, you would not be able to move around much if you sucked on that much. You'd have so much, like, you know, know, inhalable steroids running around. Because that is medicine. It's not like a magic lung opening device yeah. like you're actually inhaling medicine exactly it takes time to get that get it open <laughs> kills me every time well uh i'm just thinking know. like that what you're mentioning there it's uh not necessarily even just ignorance it's like a it's a comedic trope <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's what? like it's a visual storytelling like uh shortcut yes, yeah sure. you have the character with the asthma you know like oh things are about to get real <laughs> Yeah. You know, God, I wish that were true. If it were some sort of like courage device, <laughs> oh, inhalable it's, courage, that'd be awesome. It's just an easy trick, and it's one of those areas where like laziness meets up with ignorance and creates something uh, that's cheap and easy and hard to avoid using sometimes. And that like fast food, everyone else goes for it too, and yeah. before you know it, that's all there is. I think you just gave us a good quote for our <laughs> episode. I've got a question for everybody. I know you had your hand up, so let's see. okay. Has anybody, I have, but has anybody tried to write or written a character with a different ability? Yeah, mm-hmm. I definitely, I had, uh, well, I was writing, I am writing sci-fi, the first draft's done, I needed to take a break before I work on it again, mm-hmm. but my character, at least at the start of the story, is not telepathic, but she grew up in a world where everyone else is telepathic, so that was her disability, but I also have, um... Uh, well, I have dyslexia. I worked in characters and short stories and such with other learning disabilities. Um, then, yeah, if I thought about more, I'd come up with more. <laughs> more common. I was going to say, heck yeah. Uh, in the uh, one of my first stories, actually, we were talking about earlier, was a blind swordsman. It was, you know, early on, so it's, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. just writing for fun. I guess you would almost classify it as fanfic, but <laughs> blind swordsman. Yes, yeah. amen. Oh, uh, I tried, well, I started on writing a story, at least, about a, I don't know if this counts, really. I started writing it about a character that never learned how to speak, like a wild child kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried to write it from first person, because what I wanted to do was, uh, like, experience what a wordless brain was like. (laughs) And try to communicate it through words, which was difficult. Yeah, I imagine. (laughs) That screams out for a movie, you know? (laughs) That was, yeah, that was, like, I don't don't know how I would have done it. It's very difficult. Yeah. Um, I have two characters that the dyslexia comment made me think about. Uh, One is Percy Jackson. Yeah. I like the uh, whole... Which you didn't write, but... No, I did not. I did not write (laughs) Percy Jackson. I would be thoroughly... Very impressed with myself and my bank account if I was. Um, but no, Percy Jackson and all the uh, demigod characters, all the Olympian-born kids, 
in that series have dyslexia and ADD. (laughs) And I thought that was pretty cool because I have one of those things. And seeing it as a strength instead of a weakness is rare for me. So I love that setup. And I wish more characters with disabilities were used that way. Yeah, I also... the It's complicated. I didn't want to get into it. My character that isn't telepathic, I'm also... She also has a mental illness that I haven't decided for sure if she's going to be diagnosable. I want her to... Actually, I don't have her in the story being schizophrenic, but she's going to meet the dsm for classification of schizophrenia. And by the way, that is not multiple personality disorder. I was going to say that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, real quick, one character, and I'm saying to you, um, one character which I was working on, I based on... He'd be technically my best friend, I call him my brother. He, he and I grew up from diapers together. He is hearing impaired. Very hearing impaired. And it was a detective story. And I haven't... I'm still playing with it. I haven't taken it beyond plotting out the first story and kind of didn't really work. But he always wanted to be a detective. Well, he's hearing impaired. He could never be a cop. Mm-hmm. That would not be allowed. So he was going to be a James Gardner slash Rockford File type private eye. Going completely against his parents. He's got his MBA, and his parents are like, well, going to business. No, I want to be a detective. And it was, how is he going to answer the phones? How is he going to get to talk to the... How is he going to interact when the characters are not in front of him? And that's one good thing about modern day technology is you have Skype mm-hmm. with video. But that, I still was still having to play with stuff, and I still haven't worked it all the way through. Well, it's... Uh... <laughs> okay. I didn't see hers. Yeah, my my story is less. You know, I mentioned fictional uh-huh. maladies earlier because a big element of Threadcaster in my novel I keep bringing up in these various things. <laughs> it's yet to be published, but is working really hard toward that goal. Um, is uh, there are these debilitating illnesses that affect my characters either mentally or physically, and they're they're kind of taking hints from actual illnesses, but they're imaginary illnesses that I made up for the story. But a thing I experienced throughout it is I have you have to put yourself in the place of the person who is limited. Uh, I have a whole race of people that are turning to fire, like they're transforming them. Their their bodies are transforming to fire. Like, well, what happens when they touch water? Well, how do they wash themselves? What? How does their life? You know, how do they eat food? What kind of food can they eat? What kind of environment do they need to live on? Does you know what does their skin look like? Uh, are they able to walk even because their their feet have blisters on them? You know, it's a lot. You have to think in terms of how do people actually survive and what decisions would they make. Uh, and I had it I had it easy because I made up the illness, so I could decide that well they can still drink water. That's a rule. That's cool. They could do that. You know, that kind of thing. I can make that decision. But if you're writing a character who has an actual illness that's for real. You need to look and see how people cope with that illness and not not just assume that, you know, they, I don't know. I keep returning to the fact that, you know, this person's now helpless because all they are, their their illness, it's not, or their physical limitation, it's not true. They live a whole life, right? right? Your character, you know, they go to bed and they sleep. How do they sleep comfortably? They wake up and they eat food. How do they eat comfortably? How do they find what they need? Do they need help? And if they have help, do they hire help or do they have a, a caregiver? And, that how, kind of and how much of a expense account is that? Yeah. Yeah. Just if you're going to write an autistic person <laughs> character, don't just write it because you watch Rain Man. Yeah. Study. <laughs> I was just going to what Matt said. We have a similar mind. It's amazing. Because <laughs> I have a character as well that actually communicates through thought forms. And mm-hmm. she was four years old. And trying to communicate yes. that it was very difficult. I struggled with that quite a bit on how do you communicate how this person interacts with other people. Because for one thing, she's very young. But on the other hand, she doesn't speak. And so trying to, to write the characters around her and how they were reacting to her. Like, she does a really good job, too. Difficult. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll have to read them. Mm-hmm. Is there a difference in your writing process or in how you see the portrayal of characters who have physical versus mental illnesses? Big difference for me is, is the, is the disability visible or not? So to other people. So if someone's missing an arm, 
that's reasonably visible. If someone's missing a leg, that's also reasonably visible, although they could be wearing pants and have an artificial leg. But if someone has a mental illness, someone could be walking up and talking to them and not know they have an illness. So how people react are very different, or could be. I can see where that is true, but to be honest, I actually think some of the strongest books I've ever read are about mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, there are some great ones. Uh, was it last year or two years ago? Um, Heather Brewer held the Less Than Three conference, which was about bullying and stuff like that. But uh, one of the standout authors there was Cheryl Rainfield, the author of uh, Scars. And she has gone through more than any of us will ever have to deal with in our entire lifetimes. And it comes through in her books. And she, in fact, she writes the books she wished she had been able to read when she was young. And to be honest, what she was talking about, the abuse she'd suffer, the mental illnesses, you know, the, the, it, she doesn't have mental illness. She has a lot of things that have happened to her. It caused her to cut. It caused her to do a bunch of other things like that. You know, so she's led trauma, and all of that comes out in her books and her characters and everything like that. It was really powerful to hear her speak. Um, reading her books is a scary thing, almost. Um, some of these authors do it brilliantly. Um, and I think going there and, and almost ripping yourself bare and laying it out on the page is the most important thing a writer can do. I personally find it really scary. I write escapism of fiction. I don't rip open my soul and put it on a page. So I am always blown away by the people who can do that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the mental illness in particular is really difficult just because... Uh, well, like, we're all Westerners here. We kind of all believe in the mind-body duality. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you have, like, a, let's say you're missing a hand or something, that's like a physical thing, so it's easier for us to perceive the person with the missing hand as still being, like, a total, complete uh, person, just minus one part of their body. You know, body doesn't matter too much. But when it gets to the mind, that's when it really starts being different for us, and that, like, well, how much is this person really a person anymore now that they don't have this mental faculty or they're kind of fallen back in this way? And so it's much harder to do uh, faithfully, you know, like truthfully, realistically. Yeah. Well, there's also the independent verification. A lot of it's most mental illnesses, it's hard for a mentally ill person to fake being normal all the time but it's relatively easy to fake having a mental illness. And there's, for, except for a couple of exceptions, there's, there's a, it's hard to prove that someone has a mental illness if they are purposely trying to deceive you into thinking they have a mental illness and they know what they're doing. Knowing what you're doing is actually important, but... And that's the other thing, is that it's kind of like, it's nebulous because you can't see it. Again, the guy yeah. with the hand, uh, you can see that it's not there. People Somebody that with have mental pain problem. disorders have the same problem. How can someone prove that they're in excruciating pain? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's much more difficult to do in all ways. And it's also kind of harder, I think, to learn about just understand how those brain processes work. I think brain imaging technology is going to be the friend of many people soon. Hmm. Um, yeah, but not quite yet. It's in the research it's, stage, it's not it's the diagnosis stage. stage. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I also wanted to say that I think when, when David, I think it was you that mentioned uh, characters with disabilities as a minority. And that is really important to be able to see portrayed accurately for any minority, um, see accurately portrayed in media and treated as human. I think being able to see gay characters on TV, for example, has done a lot to normalize homosexuality in our culture and make things safer for so many people. Mm -hmm. And seeing a black family with a doctor and a doctor as the parents in the Cosby show. A doctor and a lawyer. A doctor and a lawyer as the parents. Highly successful people made it easier to see, for black people in America, to see themselves in those positions and to see that, yes, our families are legitimate. They're on TV. We can talk about these issues that are important. I think that's one of the reasons it's so crucial to do your research and to treat all of your characters as human beings because Brad said you could be introducing someone 
to these this this issue for the first time. So, yeah, I just very important to your research to know everything or try to. Well, I honestly think that's yeah. one of the biggest powers we hold as writers, and one of the things we do is creating culture. It's a responsibility. Is, yeah, it's it, to be able to put forward that image, a positive image of anything, whether it be you know a gay couple, a black family, somebody living with disabilities, any any kind of whatever, you know, whatever stereotype you want to put into it, breaking that mold can be huge. I mean, as you say, look at the look at any gay character from any movie 30 years plus back and they're a caricature that is there for comedic relief. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, we have them as just everyday mainstay characters whom I mean, if you even go with somebody like Dumbledore, Nobody even knew. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no one even knew until years later. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's really important as, you know, storytellers that we do that. And it's one of our big, you know, things, oh. goals. <laughs> things. I can think of a good word. <laughs> I think it's important that before we finish this entire discussion that we should talk about this kind of thing as an element of plot, a very important yes. element of plot. Agreed. Take, for example, in mysteries and thrillers, the revenge motive, like in uh, Phantom of the Opera, for example. It's a key plot. It's very important to the plot. You really can't do without it. And, of course, it can be a more subtle plot point. And you were talking about years and years ago. Well, years and years ago, say 1955, <laughs> there were people who were experimenting with this kind of item in the movies, but the general belief was that beautiful people were the only thing that folks went to see the movies yes. for. Yeah. And yet, there were some who tried other things. Look at Bla- Bad Day at Black Rock, which you've probably never heard of, but at any rate, it, you have good. It, it stars Spencer Tracy yep. as a one-armed detective Sort of. <laughs> He's retired, so yes. he is only sort of. And he had lost an arm in World War II mm-hmm. and was trying to give his medal to a Japanese in 1955. So he goes to this town called Honda, which is a town full of all kinds of bias and prejudice and confront some really bad people there. It's kind of a western noir sort of movie. Mm -hmm. And he is able to fend off one of the worst possible characters using his one arm because he's an expert at judo. I mean, this is the kind of thing you'd hear now, isn't it? So there were people who tried, but it kind of came up against a blank wall. And it's much more acceptable today. But still, as a plot point, I think it is... a very key one, and has always been. You can go back to the ancient Greeks. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Right. Um, I was just going to say that a kind of what a lot of things we're talking about today is that I think that issue books are important about um, mental and physical, um, I'll say, disabilities. Um, and it's important to see, you know, somebody maybe coming to terms with the fact that they have a diagnosis. But at the same time, it's also important that that's not all that's out there. That we have um, detectives who solve crimes while also using a hearing aid, and we have um, space pilots who fight aliens while also battling with their obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I think that stuff is really important, and Mm -hmm. that's showing those as normal is what's going to normalize them in our society. Exactly. Okay, and that will be our Mm -hmm. final word for this broadcast then. So, thank you, and tune in next time for as Right Pack will tackle yet another interesting issue in the writing industry next week. Good luck. Have a great week writing. The Right Pack would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore. STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis' newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.